Hello, everyone, and welcome to Africa Fire Mission's weekly virtual training session. My name is Mike, and I'm the program's director at Africa Fire Mission. Really excited that you uh, took time out of your schedule to come and join us for today's training. Today, we're joined again by Richard Gucina. Richard is one of Africa Fire Mission's volunteer fire safety advocates, and he's been doing a lot of training for us uh, this month while we're working on some EMS topics. Really excited to have Richard uh, back uh, one more time for today's training. Before we get started with today's training, just a couple of administrative notes. Um, if you stick around for at least 70% of today's training, which is usually about 40 or 45 minutes, uh, I can get you a certificate of attendance for today's training. If you're watching the screen with a couple other people, you can email me. I'll put my email in the uh, comments section. Uh, check out uh, uh, who, you've, who you're with. Let me know. I'll get them a certificate of attendance as well. Uh, your screen name for Zoom is the name that goes on that certificate. So if you need to adjust that, uh, go ahead and do that now. Uh, before we get started with today's training, I'm going to pass things over to Jose Nanjiri. He is Africa Fire Mission's fire safety officer. He's going to share a few words of encouragement. Thanks, Chief Mike. Uh, thanks, uh, Richard, for joining us again. We truly appreciate your knowledge and also we value your time. And you, we also value you for actually finding time and uh, uh, enhancing your skill and just uh, sharpening your knowledge. So in, in that breath, I, I it brought me back to when I started volunteering, when I just uh, graduated from fire school and uh, I I went to, to, to actually do my, you know, get my, my boots wet, you know, and uh, it was difficult, I must admit, it was really difficult. And uh, I came across a word that is called perseverance. And perseverance is, is actually said in the dictionary as continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. Personally, I was struggling on how to go out to the community and what do I tell the community? Because there's this perception out there that when firefighters uh, approach the fire scene, we do not have water or also we do not have fuel in our fire trucks. It's just a bad perception. It's a wrong perception, you know? So there's that worldview that we are not... Uh, equally tasked to our job. So for me, I persevered. I went every day, in the, even though today I'm checking out, I told myself, I need to do one more thing to keep on practicing so that I can get it right. Man, I persevered. And in this particular case, it was actually the gas cylinder uh, practice. I persevered through and made sure that every time, every day I am, learning something until when I, I was confident in myself that, that I am capable, I went out and talked to the fire chief and he actually released me to actually go to the community. So my encouragement to you today is, in spite the difficulties, difficulties that you face either in your community or even in the workplace, how do you get to work continuously towards bettering yourself? You know, because in the first half, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. It is you to tell yourself, how do I make it better? All right. So from now on, my encouragement to you is persevere through effort. All right. Put effort in. Yeah. So that you can achieve greatness, you know, despite the difficulty. As much as you're finding the failure and opposition from either your chiefs or your, your, your supervisor, keep at it until you are better for you to serve your community much better. Thank you so much. I hope you got something from that encouragement. Back to you, Chief Mike. Excellent. Thank you, Jose. Those are some wise words. You really, uh, you get out of things as much as you put into them. So a uh, great message about perseverance there. Thank you for that, Jose. And thank you for all the work that you're doing to empower and encourage all of the firefighters to, throughout Africa to better serve their communities. It's much appreciated. 
I'll ask everybody to uh, stick around if you're available uh, when we get done at the top of the hour with the formal part of our training. Uh, we're going to pass things back over to Jose to host a tea time. And, and tea time is, is just a time where um, you can ask some questions about today's training or uh, discuss any other topic that may be on your mind. It's a great place for some fellowship, uh, some brotherhood uh, amongst firefighters and people that, that share the same career as you, the same uh, calling as you. So I invite you all to uh, stick around for that if you have time as well. Keep an eye in the chat. I'm going to post uh, a link to our Google Drive uh, where you'll be able to find a recording from today's training as well as uh, our other lessons that we've done throughout the year. Uh, if you missed one of our lessons, you can go there, watch the video of the training, answer uh, some simple questions, tell us what you learned, and I'll get you a certificate of attendance for that training as well. So uh, please uh, be sure to use that free resource uh, that's available to you. You'll be able to find that a little bit later in the chat. Uh, so that's enough out of me. Uh, I think we're going to pass things over now to our trainer of the day, Richard Gacina, uh, to get us started. So take it away, Richard. Uh, good morning. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's afternoon. Uh, can you hear me well, Chief Mike? Yes, sir. Very well. Loud and clear. Thank you so very much. So, everyone, welcome today. I feel um, I feel privileged. I, I'm humbled to have you, to have everyone. We have over, over 48 uh, guys who are participating. Please keep on encouraging your brothers and sisters in firefighting, in the first responders, in your WhatsApp groups. Uh, share the message, and uh, I think uh, we still have a very huge number. We are uh, we we need over over three hundred students, uh, over three hundred seats in the in the, uh, in, the in, in the in the class. So welcome today. Today we're going to run something, uh, some simple things, some simple uh, terms. Uh, I believe we, it's something that we have been going through in uh, one way or another. Uh, just a minute. Chief Mike, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Looks good. Ah, thank you so very much. So today we're going to learn about injuries to the head and the spine. The spine, we also include uh, the neck as we go downwards. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. You can raise your hand in the middle. You can um, chat. You can write your question on the chat, and we're going to. Have probably have a very smooth class today. We don't have a lot of blood. That is for Jose, who is always afraid of uh, blood, and everyone else who is. Uh, I always give you a um, disclaimer when I tell you, like, today we don't have a lot of blood. So, introduction to today. <coughs> Sorry for that. Um, the, some of these injur injuries to the head, the neck, they are life threatening because we know the head carries the brain. It carries also the neck carries um, the major uh, blood arteries. It carries um, the jugular. It carries the carotid. It carries the nose, the mouth. So some of these injuries to the head, they they are so uh, like threatening. Then the other thing is, ninety percent of these injuries will also result to the injury to the neck. So. So some of these things that can cause that can cause a head injury very um some are very simple they go from simple to complex. Uh, when uh, the simple one is when you trip and fall and you knock your head. Uh, then uh, then uh, also when someone is showering on their bathroom and then they trip they fall down and then they hit their head or they hit their uh, their neck. Uh, when you are diving, you know uh, we have good divers who dive. The head first, so it might the the, uh, the surface of the water might be so hard, and then it injures your head. Uh, the other thing is when we engage in sports, this is uh, rugby, basketball, football. These these are uh, these sports that we call them contact contact sports. Uh, the other one is uh, when someone is hit on the head. Maybe in Kenya we call them. We have these guys who are always they beat you and uh, get her. Like uh, what happens mostly in the in the in the, uh, in towns, and then someone will be they can hit you on the head. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, when we, I remember when we were young, we used to hang on the roads and the pickups that were just passing by to uh, next to our road. So 
they can also resort to some of these. How to suspect is very, most of these patients will go unresponsive. They won't be responding because the engine of the body, the head itself or the brain has also has been knocked out and then they, you can be very unconscious. Then you'll see visible wounds. Um, then uh, observe the patient. Number one, you need to check for the basics. We go back to ABC. So we go to airway, breathing and uh, circulation. So we dive into hand injuries. Some of them can be open, some can be crossed. This would be, you'll see some breathing or not breathing at all. Which means if the patient has head injury and they are not breathing and you can see, you can see deformities. So which means they might be breathing from inside. So they will have um, blood in the blade. So we have the, you will have them, you'll have uh, some swelling, depressions, or what you call um, deformities on the head. It might be a swell, it might be a depression. There's something that some of them, are, like um, the, the head or the skull, the skull bone has been created. Uh, Some of them, they change from, they will always appear very confused. They will change the your level of uh, of unresponsive from responsive to unresponsive in a fraction of a minute. There will be dizziness, they will be very much confused because the head or the brain has been tampered with and it has to. Then they will be dizzy, then uh, we'll have some unequal pupils. The pupil is the black uh, part of the eye that we used to see. Uh, then we have, uh, they will have headaches. You can see some clear fluid either from the ear or from the nose. But this one would, will also be depend, determina, determined by the level or what the mechanism is. They have stiff neck. They will tell you that like, probably they will try to move the neck and then they will be able to move the neck. Uh, uh, then there are other chances that uh, they won't be able to move their body parts. They will tend to be. They will. They will. They will uh, be like paralyzed. You tell them to wiggle their toes. They will. Wiggle. You tell them to lift to to uh to lift their hand or to pinch you. They will tell. They will be able to do that. You ask them if they can feel what you're doing on the legs, on the hands, and then they will tell you probably no. I what are you doing? They will ask you what are you doing. Then uh, the other point is. They will appear to have a tingling sensation. And this is what you feel when uh, you when when you when you're late, when you're not uh, when when you you sit a lot on a hanging seat, you feel some of the in the in the muscles. You feel like someone is like they have sharp needles piercing on their muscles. Or they will feel something. But so if there is no left threatening conditions. Then you can do physical examination as you move on. Then the other thing is, please, if you find this patient, most of them from um, RTA or motor vehicle or road traffic accidents, uh, avoid too much movement. Avoid too much movement because it may accelerate now or it may agitate more into cause more injuries uh, to the victim. Then the other thing is, you need to do a physical. Assessment. Physical assessment using means use you use your eyes and you use your hands. This is where you see and then you feel with your hands. You will see blood stain. You will see deformities. You will feel uh, crack bones with your hands. And the other thing is we stabilize the head and the neck. Maybe we have a if you have a C collar, you do the C collar or the the they call a collar. So then the other thing is you need to know, you need to ask if the patient is responsive, you can be able to check or you can be able to ask them what happened. If uh, they, they will tell you, if they are talking, they will tell you exactly what happened. I was hit by a bicycle, riding on the road and then my bicycle, I tripped, my bicycle fell and then I hit my head. So the other thing is we'll have, um, you check, you'll be able to check on their mental You'll be able to check on their mental on their mental status.
So the other thing is you'll be able to assess a patient. If, if the patient can't talk, uh, please ask the bystanders because you always say the bystanders will always give you more information about um, the, the situations. So how to check for, for, for patient responsiveness? Ask them, um, where does it hurt? They will tell you, my head, my, I have a headache, my neck hurts, my hands, my leg, they will tell you. Then you ask them, what happened? These are the events that what were they doing so that they can find them in that. So uh, the thing is, in all this, if the patient is resp responsive and they are not, they can talk to you. Please make a point of having a rapport with them. Create a friendship that they can be able to share information with uh, you. Then uh, physical examinations, make sure, number one, we said, remember on the last topics, we said like you need to be on your gloves. Always have some pieces of gloves in your pocket, uh, in your backpack, in your fire engine, make sure there is a piece of, or a, a box of one or, or a packet of one so that you can be able to do this. With your gloves, hand, make sure you, you check the torso. The torso, this means uh, the whole of the chest. You do, you check on the breathing, you, lead, you check on the rise and fall of the chest, they will tell you that. Uh, then you can check on uh, the pulse of the patient, count on the breath, on the breathing, uh, the breath taken in one minute. Then assess the whole body, do not exempt any part of that patient. You have to check from the head to the toe, even at the back or the spine. You make sure like you check all of that because uh, some of these uh, injuries and some of, some of these uh, things that you are going to find out is you will see like uh, the patient uh, is, feeling, is not feeling anything, but in fact, they are in shock. So the body has already started shutting down some of these. So when you assess them, you can be able to check if the patient has other injuries. And the other thing is, please do not assume uh, the patient. Do not assume them. Let them tell you. If they can tell you, listen to them, please. If you need to, if you if you're doing a physical examination and you find maybe a bum or a or, or a swelling on the on the spine, uh, do not assume it. It might be something that you need to attend to that. Then you double check, keep them uh, immobile when waiting for additional EMS. If you don't have an ambulance somewhere, keep on reassessing. Reassessing means you keep on checking the things that you are uh, arrested reading. I need to go back. Now uh, we give the patient oxygen. You need to check if the oxygen uh, is still moving. Uh, you made the, you you put you you put them on, um, on on the stretcher or the gurney. You need to make sure like they are so immobile, they are not moving. So face injuries. These are some of the wounds that we go, we we can encounter in uh, in head and uh, spine injuries because they you know the head is carry, carries the face and the nose. So. In everything, in everything that we do, if you see a face, like a wound in the face that is significant to uh, the nature of injuries or the mechanism of injury. So we need to assume like the patient had some spine or neck injury. So do not move the patient. Uh, these are some of the things that you can be able to see. These are some of the things that you can be able to look at. Look for deformities in the skull, in the face, Look for depressions, depressed or spongy areas on the skull. You can be able to touch, feel it. That's why we said you need to use, you need to use your, your glove hand so that you can be able to touch. You can feel. If there's something that is not okay, then you, you, you deal with it. Uh, look for, for blood, maybe some clear fluid from the nose, from the ears. They can tell you. The, if the ID is, 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 uh, is swollen and shutting, you need to take care of that. You see raccoon eyes, the raccoon eye, we're going to see a small a picture of a raccoon eye that you will have what we call a black push on the eye. Then we have an equal uh, battle signs. Battle signs 
it's something, if you look at the behind the ear, you will have some discoloration. So that's, that's also a better sign. Then an EQ people, people, these are the people who see one, one will be a little bit bigger than the other one will be smaller. So uh, then you see some uh, object impaled or punctured, they, they impaled on the skull. Maybe there's a knife, there's a nail, there's an arrow. You see some of these. Uh, these are things that we need to check on. Then uh, if, we, if there is no signs of skull fracture, apply dressing. I uh, use direct pressure to control the bleeding. Uh, then remember last time we talked about the general <clears throat> principles of wound care. And then never wrap a bandage around the neck because you'll end up struggling that uh, patient. So for, for, for wounds, replace the first key, uh, the flaps. If you see anything, like maybe the skin had peeled off, you can try to, you make sure like the place is sterile with a sterile goods or a dressing or a clean dressing, you can uh, press it over. Then you control breathing as we move on. You secure the dressing using a triangular bandage if needed, or you can use uh, a dressing. So neck injuries, these are some of the critical injuries that you will find in, uh, in, in, in real victims. Because the neck means either the, the, the spine or the bones or the neck bones, they have been, uh, number one, they can be dislodged. The other thing is they can have injuries to the muscles or what you call the spinocranial muscles. These are the muscles of the of the neck, or you will have, uh, you can find uh, some bleeding from either the carotid or the jugular vein. If it's a minor wound, treat it, uh, treat it as a minor wound. Uh, if you see um, any significant open wound in the neck, it's an, it's, an, it's an emergency because you know we have talked about the things that you can be able to find. Remember, the neck uh, is what supports the head and the head with the spinal cord, that's where most of the nerves or the nerves passes through the spine. So when the neck is injured, so it means this guy can paralyze or they can even go to rest and die. Uh, for a general uh, principles of wound management, like what we did last time, our last, in our last lesson, then you control breathing, we do direct pressure, breast, uh, do dressing and then bandaging apply as you move on. So when bleeding is, is bleeding is a, is a, is not uh, does not is not controlled with one with one dressing, you add another dressing. Then you keep on adding those dressing at it. Then you do that's why you do dressing 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 uh, in direct direct pressure in direct pressure and tonicate. But you don't tonicate on the neck. So injury to the eye. So we're moving on smoothly. Injury to the, to the eyes. This can be serious because the vision would be infected, will be affected, sorry. So then uh, the easiest way, if uh, you have um, a trauma bag or you have a package kit, it always has the eye, the, the eye read or what you call the eye, the, the, the eye bandages, something that is, uh, it's, it, ha it assumes the shape of the eye. Then uh, any movement of the eye, it exaggerates or worsens, uh, sorry, it worsens the injury. So when you're doing, when you're caring for, for a patient with uh, one, one eye is injured, so you have to make sure like you cover both, Eyes because we know when one eye moves, the other one moves. So you try as much as possible to cover the both, both eyes. This will help them to, uh, to, to also deal with the effect of the right. So 
Very simple, please. If you if you also do it, you do you deal with it as a matter as a, of wound. You do simple. What we learned about last time, the general principles of wound care. Clean goes, clean bandage, be on your BSI. So then the other thing is do not pull the object. Remember we said last time you stabilize the object or the impaled object inside the eye. So use uh, what you remember last time we talked about a donut bandage or you can use a cup to stabilize. Then uh, you cover both eyes. So then you have that or small particles in the eye. Then uh, do not let, let the, the, the victim or the patient up there because the moment they start rubbing on the eyes, it means that there are small particles, they will be causing more. Um, maybe in the eye, inside the eye, you're going to be causing more arms in, uh, in the reeds or on the reeds. So we can see if the victim tears, you flush the object. You turn, if they are tearing, well and good. If they're not tearing, we'll see what we, we can do. Then uh, gently pull up the eyelid, uh, eyelid out and down over the lower lid and crunch. Uh, catch the particle on the lash. You try to open the eyes. Then if, uh, uh, then for chemical, uh, if, if, if the patient or the victim is not tearing, you can use clean learning water. If, uh, for example, uh, if one if the eye one this is the eye that has issue, you you have to clean. You don't clean like this because you will also injure. You also affect the other eye. So you you start from the nose, going or on the nose bone, going outside. So uh, chemicals or, or to the eye or brushes, general principles of wound care: rinse the lid with the running water at least twenty minutes. Position the affected eye lower than the unaffected. So that's why we said you you learn it from the nose, the nose bone down. So the other thing is injury to the injury to the ears. Sorry. Injury to the ears, breathing or cerebral spinal fluid from the ear. This this spinal fluid fluid uh, spinal. The cerebral spinal fluid, only for the CSF, it's the clear fluid that we are talking about. That you need to be very, you, you need to be very careful on that. You need to check it. You need to look at it. So if you see it, make sure you inform uh, the definitive healthcare of your origin for the EMTs. Let them know, and please do not try to wipe it. If you see it, take a, a cream gauze or a cream uh, yeah, a cream gauze, then you cover it. Uh, then uh, do not use direct pressure. Do not directly put pressure on the fluid that is coming out. So we said you just cover it. Then uh, do not try to remove anything for it because it might have it might have stuck to the brain. Then if there is an insect, generally pour a lukewarm water into the ear and throat it out. So care for, inter for external ear injuries, control breathing, remember what they say, direct pressure, and then breathing. Remember, we keep on saying like we need to do general uh, wound principles. We learned that in our previous uh, session. Jose? Jose, we can take a minute break. If there is a question, we can answer the questions. If it's possible, if there is any question, we can take a minute break. I think Jose is not available. Uh -huh. I'm trying to look if, uh, yeah, you can try to also, you can put your questions on the chat. We'll be able to I am them. available. Ah, finally. What was the question? No, you just ask. I was just checking up if there is a question uh, on the chat or maybe oh, you have seen oh. any question for us. No, I think we are good. 
Ah, good. Uh, so we can continue. Yes, sir. We can continue. Uh, thank you so very much. From there, we go to injuries to the internal part of the eye or ear injuries. Uh, follow, remember, we keep on saying we follow the general principles of wound care. I think we, I, I believe we can be able to remember them. Uh, then we'll see what we will, uh, so that we can be able to do pin dresses, bandaging, uh, and also yeah. wound care. So help the patient sit down if they are. Someone is saying something. Was there someone is saying something? No. On his own. Ah, thank you. So if the patient is uh, lying down and they are comfortable sitting, sitting, sitting up, so you can be able to let to help them sit. So, but the, for me, I always say if the patient does not feel comfortable sitting down, treat them or take care of them in that position. Then uh, treat the affected ear lower than the unaffected ear. Cover the, uh, cover the ear with a loose style and dressing. Do not apply or crunch the ear inside or ear close. So do not push too much. Do not put too much pressure in. So just do a loose, a loose dressing. So no injuries. This can be caused to, they can be, uh, they can cause uh, heavy breathing. Sorry, excuse me. So breathing from the back of the nose down the throat leads to immediate collateral. So they might be breathing at the back of the nose, but the larynx meets. And we say, remember, we say anything, the blood should be circulating inside the body, not in, out. So anything that does that, please make sure they attend or uh, they seek medical attention. So how will you know that you will see them? They will have frothy, uh, frothy, or what would have they have bloody saliva. So care for this is general principle for the wound. Always apply if it's inter if it if it's external. Uh, let the patient sit, uh, tilt their head for slightly forward with the mouth open so that they can be able to breathe the mouth. Do not remove the object. If something that is stuck or impaled, please do not try to, uh, to remove it. Uh, then do not treat the head patient backward. Do not beat or let them lean backward. So let them pinch their nose strings, as you can see on the picture. Uh, give them a bandage or what they, something they can hold on there. So uh, release pressure this is when you, you pinch on the nose and then you release slowly. Pinch for around ten, for 10 minutes. You remember your breathing with, with the mouth. Then uh, if the patient is unresponsive, put them on a recovery position. And please do not pack dressing inside them. So injury to uh, impact, impaled, impaled uh, to the cheek is something that, this is the cheek. So you have an object, maybe a nail, a piece of wound, you're trying to do something. This is what happens. If you can be able to remove it, remove it. If you cannot be able to remove it, please leave it uh, there. Then what you do, how to care for it, you have to have like two pairs of bandage, one from inside and the other one from outside. So injury to the teeth or the mouth, we know some of these uh, injuries still caused by, can be caused by uh, motor vehicle injuries. You'll feel them, you'll see them. You'll see some of them having uh, the danger or the truth, they are out. So what happens is you try as much as possible, you put some, some goals, control the breathing, let them, if they can be able to talk, if they can be able to, they are responsive. Tell them to press the bandage or the, uh, the, the bandage over the breathing eye part. Then the other thing, make sure like the airway is open. Then 
if they are breeding through the mouth, not tell them not let them not try to swallow the blood. Let the blood drain from the mouth. So breeding these victims may sit. If they can be able to sit, let them uh, sit. If it's something that uh, we said, remember we said what we said, uh, breeding to the thunk is a uh, some of the uh, these are some of the craziest injuries to the tongue. Maybe someone was walking or they have products and then they beat on their tongue. So save the truth if the truth is uh, avoidable because we know some they can it can be reattached. We have some uh, hospitals that can do that. Then um, uh, touch do not touch on the the root. You see the part that goes inside the, the gum. So don't touch it. Just touch on the on the clown using your glove hand. So the other thing is, please do not uh, force the the the, um, the truth back to the root. Please do not carry it with you to the victim. Uh, to the hospital. Sorry. So this is something that we're going to. This is what we are doing. This is just a skill. I want us. I want maybe we can go through it with time. With time allows. We have some few minutes. So check the victim. The victim hands. Remember we said with your glove hand you check the head. What are you checking for? Deformities, um, wounds, blood, uh, depressions, swellings, all those things. Some, we are taking on what is abnormal to that person's head. So the other thing is you check on the neck. Checking on the neck, you don't have to move the patient. If uh, you lie on your back, uh, the body has what you call the normal, the holes or the voids. You can be able to put your, 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 your hands below the neck. With your gloved hand, check if there is bleeding. Feel if there is continuity of what or the, the neck bones. Uh, sensation is when you pinch on the, you can you can be able to hold their toe and ask the patient, can you feel what toe or what toe am I holding? You can also try to tickle them, you see if they can be able to feel uh, that. You can also ask the patient to wiggle their toes or to crunch or to push against you have you 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 hands with your feet. On the hand, check on the on the on the nails or the fingers. You can be able to ask them what if they can feel exactly what you're doing. So if they can be able to make a fist, well and good. Let them squeeze their hand. Here are some of the skills that we are trying to understand how to make sure you check on sensitization. You check on the patient. So brain injuries, this will occur with the not, some of these injuries will occur with the high velocity or what call speed, how high speed injuries. Uh, they will occur to blow to the head with or without open wounds. Brain injuries are likely to, to likely with scar fracture. Remember the brain, it, it is quotient with the what you call the CSF, all this. Spine to it. If we have an open car or a broken uh, head, uh, head scar, bone, it means the brain will be cut. Then uh, possibilities of brain, brain swell and brain bleeding, they are very high. Uh, some of the um, symptoms that you come up with, that, that you, you can come across is they will have headache. Some to be severe and very persistent. They'll have, they'll be confused. You'll ask them which when is today. They'll tell you probably Monday, Tuesday, and you know exactly like. This. Then we'll have coordination with movement. If you tell them to squeeze, they will push on the leg. If you tell them uh, to look on the on the on the on the left, they maybe probably look on the right. So continuation weaknesses will have numbness. They will have gross sensation on uh, maybe the legs, the fingers, the toes. They will probably be paralyzed. They will always be. They will always complain of 
vomiting, they feel like vomiting, they will lose there, there will be seizures. An eco is about your same problem with visions. They will, they will see bloody visions because the optical nerves or the part of the brain that control eyes is infected. They will have breathing pro uh, problems or irregularities because, you know, whatever happens in the brain is what is the outcome on the other bodies. Uh, they can be involved, yeah, temporary impairment. Um, uh, some of the victims may have maybe knocked up or they will go they will be up. They will, they will go and shop. But they also in a minute they might come back in. So temporary confusion, memory loss about events, they won't be able to tell, they won't be able to relate what happened and what is happening. So they will also have a brief, brief loss of memory. Uh, they have um, mental status, maybe mild, moderate, unusual behavior. These guys will not be able to coordinate some of these things. And they have unusual. They have some headache, maybe severe, from severe to uh, to major, uh, to minor to severe. Uh, medical, uh, medical. They, uh, these patients may, if if you take them to hospital, they will, they will definitely uh, recover. So head injuries, if they are not breathing, as the member we said, they have two types of opening the airway. Number one is jaw thrust. And the other one, the other one is chin lift, head lift, maneuver. So for patients, you suspect they have head and neck injuries. We, uh, we only use jaw thrust maneuver. Then follow protocols for oxygen. Man, uh, then you do manual stabilization of the head. You know the patient. Well, make sure this patient is well, so is well secured on the spine. So then you do what you do. What next to do? Please make sure you don't move your eyes away from the patient because you remember we said uh, earlier. We say like this patient can do, can become can lose and be unconscious any minute. And the other thing is we control pressure, do not do direct, we do padding and then, then monitor the vital signs. Now vital signs is said it's breathing, uh, blood pressure, if you can go to do blood pressure, you can do to do pulse rate, and that's the number of uh, number of lights are reducing. And in all the others experts, vomiting so do not be afraid when you see this victim vomit then provide additional care for for the skull skull fractures you can be able to see them some of them can be see you can be that you can be able to see them some of them you can have to feel them uh then remember direct pressure please do not because it, if you do some direct pressure it goes direct hitting the brain uh these are some signs of the skull of a skull fracture, you see bruises, bruises on the on the eyelid, mostly the lower ones. Uh, they will be breathing from the nose, they will be breathing from the ears, they will have breathing from the heart of the of, of they will be breathing of fluid, and you will have deformities. A continuations. Uh, remember we talked about raccoon. Raccoon eyes, here it is. Can you remember to see that, Jose? Mm, he's busy. These are what you call raccoon eyes, this part. So you see, it is decolorized. We have this one, and then when you have this one. Let me see if we can be able to see. Uh, care is uh, normal, general food principles. Do not clean the wound, press on it, or remove in pelt. Object, cover the wound with the thyroid dressing. So here it is, if it's bridging, apply pressure around the neck, around the wound, uh, use rings, link dressing, do not move the patient. Spinal injuries, this is what we are talked about, the spinal cord, 
Uh, then we have the spinal cord and then we have the cautions. These are the nerves. Uh, what happens is if you have some of these conditions, they will injure, they'll cause probable damage to the spinal cord. We know the spinal cord is what controls uh, the nerves. And of damage depend on the nature of and location of the injuries, movement. Um, if you got injuries from the lower back, they'll affect your legs. As you move on, as you move uh, higher the ladder, if you have injuries to the neck, it affect everything below the neck. Perform a standard patient, or what we do, Dr. ABC, general care of, uh, for the wounds. As we move on, EIT is support the head in the position you found it. So the other thing is, if the patient is non-responsive, you cannot, you cannot see, they don't, you don't, they are not breathing, the pulse, dip, the pulse or the heartbeat are not available, put the patient head in line with the body. Manually stabilize the head, open the airway and perform CPR. So the other thing is, we said, do not move. Make sure if you're moving, move the patient minimally. Then avoid, then avoid um, unnecessary movement. If we're doing CPR, make sure you manually stabilize the head. Then you, if you're turning the patient, turn the patient as one unit. So if you alone move the patient into hindsight or what are the high sense recovery position. High sense recovery position is a technique that you put patient without more moving their body. Um, mostly we have these patients that you have injuries to their heads. Uh, maybe they were riding on uh, motorcycles. And this is what will uh, we will relearn a little bit of it in times. I remove the helmet, Miyoka, only if it's life threatening. They need to follow the protocols. Um, then, uh, if there's something falling from the, if there's an impaled object, please do not remove uh, the helmet. Here is uh, a picture of how you remove. So you see, they have, first of all, manually stabilize the neck. Then you remove the helmet as a unit. Make sure there is coordination. So we talked about uh, the sixth collar or the, uh, the cervical collar. This is what they used to stabilize the head and the neck. Uh, most first responders do not apply the cervical cora by themselves, but assist with EMTs. If you can be able to apply this, very easy. So the steps to apply a sick collar, let me see if we can be able to see it. Here they are. Applying a sick collar, choose the correct size by measuring the fingers on the top. You see, if you look at this picture, the first A is measuring from the jaw or the, the, um, the multiple to the collarbone. If they have, you see like this, this patient has one, two, three. So you come transfer the same, same number of fingers to the cervical collar. It is stated here. You can start from here and then you measure it well. Uh, how to apply it? Remember we said that the, the, the we have voids in, uh, in, 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 in the patient's body or in our bodies, follow those. So remember I said, do not move the patient. Use the, use, uh, so here it is. Then uh, backboard or what called a spine board in Kenya. Spine injury may usually immobilize, you need to immobilize them. You need to make sure like this patient is not moving and studying. So you may have the spine boards or the backboard in your 
find you know in your on in your ambulance. So positioning the patient on a long board, these are uh, three or more rescuers that are needed. Position on the long one one side, uh, like you can see here. Then you move the patient in your other unit. So here it is. Uh, position at uh, you position the the spine board or the backboard close the uh, on the other one side of the victim. Then uh, the rest the, the responders or the helpers be on the other side. Then you move the patient as a unit. You log load the patient as a unit. Then you place them back. Then you see here this patient has been strapped in the board comfortably. So, Jose, any question to that point? We don't have any in the chat yet. Man. So, thank you so very much thank for listening. So now, sorry. Thank you so very much. For Go ahead. Listening. I was just checking the chat. Ah, uh, sure, sure, sure. So that marks the end of our lesson today. Thank you so very much, Chief Mike. Back to you, Chief Mike. All right, thank you, Richard. We much appreciate that. Lots of good information in there. Um, just want to make two quick uh, uh, comments it's with some of that great information. Uh, as a first responder, if you've got if you're dealing with someone wearing that that helmet, uh, um, the recommendation is to just leave that in place until they get to the hospital setting. Um, and you can use uh, some medical tape if you've got that available to sort of tape it to their shoulders and hold it in place. Um, so just something to think about there. I would also like to refer you back to uh, a training that we'd done previously, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Uh, and if you follow that link, that was a training that we offered in 2023. And there's been some uh, a lot of research done in Great Britain about the use of sea collars and or the lack of use of sea collars and, and why they're moving away from using the cervical collars uh, during extrication and, and certain traumatic events. So if you follow that link, there's a really interesting training session by one of the doctors um, that participated in that study and wrote that study. So I'd encourage you all to go take a look at that. You can also find that if you go to africafiremission.org, go to our resources tab, firefighter training, and look under our 2023 virtual online trainings. You'll find that it's called extrication and trauma or exit training, a uh, really great piece I'd like to refer everybody to, to check out. At this point in time, uh, I think we'll wrap up sort of the formal portion of our training and then we'll open up the floor to any questions. So I want to take this time to thank Richard. Um, been doing a lot of teaching for us this month and it's very much appreciated. Done a great job leading most of our EMS lessons uh, this much uh, this month. Uh, so thank you very much, Richard. Uh, I know that's uh, that takes some time and some expense for you to do that as a volunteer. It's very much appreciated. And thank you to all of you that are using uh, your your time uh, and 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 your expenses too to get your bundles so that you can join us for these trainings. Uh, we try to offer these uh, we offer these at no charge. Uh, just the, your time and 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 your uh, your data to to access it. And we're so appreciative that you guys uh, do that. Try to better yourselves so that you can better serve your community. Um, the stuff that we do, it's really a calling from God to, to come and serve our communities and for you guys to really dedicate yourselves. Join us on Wednesdays for these trainings. Uh, it's really great. So thank you all for being here. Uh, as Richard mentioned at the beginning, we've got 300 seats in here so we can fill them all up. Invite your friends, invite your colleagues, and we hope to see you all again next week. <laughs>